The Associated Equipment Company was a British company founded about 1912, made quite a name for itself in the realm of building buses and trucks. One of the more successful trucks that it made was the 4x4 Matador, which entered British Army service mainly as an artillery tractor. However, in 1941, one of their designers had this brilliant idea of using the Matador chassis as the basis of what would effectively become a wheeled tank. You see, the Germans were wandering around in the deserts of North Africa with fairly heftily armed, armored cars. So the British thought you know, it might be a good idea to have something to counter it. And so as a private venture, AEC built the Mark I armored car. It was basically going to be a wheeled tank. It's, in fact, the turret that they put on the thing was lifted straight off of a valentine. They built somewhere around 120 of these things. My memory is eluding me at this moment. It, it, it's a thing that happens when you get more gray hair. And uh, yeah, I know it, it's going to happen to you. Don't laugh if it hasn't already happened. Uh, but anyway, eventually they moved on to the AEC Mark II. Now for the Mark II, they replaced the Valentine turret with a custom built one with a six pounder gun. They presented these AECs to the British Army. British Army says, fantastic, we'll buy them. Uh, they didn't actually end up using them all that much, though. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to the history towards the end. But what you're basically looking at is as close to a British tank in capability. Because remember, at the time, we're still talking cruisers like Crusader at best, except on wheels. And it's got a, a diesel engine, so it might actually be more reliable than the British tanks like Crusader. So there, there might be something to this. Anyway, that's the backstory. So as we look at the vehicle itself, I mean, firstly, I'll, I'll just observe this is not ballistic. This is simply a bit of shielding to stop knocks and bumps, especially for the suspension components underneath so you don't run aground. The armor values are interesting. You go on the web and you go, what are the armor values of the AC Mark 1, 2, or 3? And you, you get figures like two and a half inches sloped. This ain't two and a half inches slope. We took a measuring tape to it because we were fairly sure this wasn't two and a half inches slope. The thickest armor plate seems to be this lower front hull here, slightly angled, and it comes out as about an inch and a quarter. Armor plates on the side, you're looking at an inch. Again, angled slightly outwards. Uh, it's less than an inch, maybe, uh, on the upper hull. And th the figures that you see online, they're not right. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. Another thing you'll see is that it's a combination of bolted and uh, correction riveted. No, it was right the first time, bolted and welded. Normally, if you have something bolted, it's because you want to be able to remove components. Otherwise, you go with riveting. No, for some reason, they just want well, bolts. I don't know, maybe AC like bolts. But whether they're bolted and welded, I don't know. Little uh, splash guard here for the bullets to stop it ricocheting up. There is a windshield very convenient uh, because this thing will go along at a reasonable click uh, reasonable clip forgive me uh, no officially it says like 60 kilometers an hour in actuality it, according to the drivers here it'll go a little bit faster and then well that's it you, you get to your standard vehicle equipment you got wing mirrors actually do work uh, low vis headlight couple of uh, towing mounts and well that's pretty much the gist of it Looking at the vehicle from the side, it sort of demonstrates the, I don't know, we call it the brutalist approach to vehicle design. It's not the most elegant looking vehicle at all, but that wasn't really what they had in mind when they designed it. So obviously it is a little bit higher than your typical vehicle. You've got four very large wheels, one on each corner, as you might expect, perhaps. But there are some advantages. So firstly, you'll see that the side of the hull expands outwards to the widest point at the turret ring before narrowing back down again. Again, this is simply to allow for a larger turret. Remember, the very original of these things were with a Valentine's turret, and now we have something looks a little bit more Cromwell-ish, I guess, perhaps. Uh, it's not, but this kind of gives you the impression of the style of the time. Uh, you can also see that it's a combination of welded and bolted. Quick ask around, nobody's entirely giving me an answer as to why this is the case. 
escape hatch on the side. Now, again, this is literally escape. The only normal way in and out of this vehicle is to climb up and get down in. Or if you're the driver, you get in the front hatch. Obviously a little inconvenient or perhaps dangerous if you're knocked out in combat and you have to get out, well, you, you drop this and punch out. But as you can see, it's not something you would ordinarily open from the outside. Uh, but the other advantage of the angle uh, of the armor coming out is that you do get a little bit greater armor effect in this because of you were basically sloping the angle just in the vertical instead of the horizontal aspect. What would you say the uh, horizontal instead of the vertical? I guess it depends very much on your perspective. Large stowage boxes. If there's anything in here worth opening. Some are easier to open than others. Okay, just a tarp. Uh, this one looks like you have to undo some bolts to actually open them. And then you get to the suspension underneath. Now you're looking at basic leaf spring suspension here. But if you were to get down and have a look at the actual powertrain, you're going to see that the uh, prop shaft, which goes forward, has ex exposed splines. And my thinking behind this is that as the wheels uh, are moving around, you're going to be altering the distance a little bit between the front axle and the transfer case. So it's going to try to extend or contract a little bit. So those splines should allow that little range of motion. Uh, and it's... I'm not sure if it's the, the best answer to the solution, but it does seem to work here. The other thing to note is the steering system. So the steering is applied to one wheel primarily. So as you turn the wheel, there's a shaft that comes out and it turns this tie rod forwards and backwards. And so I think it's a tie rod or you call it a push rod or a pull rod. I don't care what you call it. I'm not a mechanical engineer. It comes to a pivot point at the front, which then applies another force to a rod on the inside slightly to the uh, to the front of this wheel which will then turn this wheel there is a another tie rod or cross rod or whatever the heck you want to call it which goes from this wheel to the other wheel so as this wheel is pushed it then pulls or pulls the other wheel along with it now that actually, part of it is actually not entirely unique to this vehicle you'll see that in a few other things uh, but uh, outside of that, you can see a little bit of protective covering for the universal joint in the middle there. And yeah, that's pretty much the whole side. The turret, well, you can see the pistol port. We'll probably come back to that in a little bit. Very vertical front facing. The, again, the armor values on this thing, the, the figures that you find online... They don't seem to match what's physically in front of me. So I put the ruler up against this thing and it comes out at about an inch and a half at best. A little bit of storage at the back and then you get to the engine. Pausing briefly at the wheels and you see that some of the nuts are a little bit colorful. Why perhaps you may ask, are some of them red and some of them not? Well, it's because some of them are reverse thread. Righty tighty lefty loosey does not necessarily apply, especially in 1940s vehicles, and particularly especially in 1940s British vehicles. So ordinarily, you would find a lot of vehicles, the wheel nuts on one side thread in the traditional direction, and the wheel nuts on the other side thread in the other direction. The theory being that as the wheels go round and round, the wheels on the armored car go round and round. It doesn't really work, does it? And... Uh, they would either tighten or loosen if uh, because the thread designs hadn't really advanced at that point. Of course, later on now, you don't care. It's The, the threads are always the same direction. But in World War II, uh, that wasn't necessarily the case. So to identify which one was a reverse thread, you'd paint it. Now, what I find interesting on this is that you have some reverse thread and some normal thread on the same wheel. And if you look at the wheels on the other side... They aren't changed around. So you have the same outer ring are red on the left-hand side as on this right-hand side wheel, whilst the inner ring of bolts is normal threaded on both sides. I haven't figured out quite why that should be the case. I am sure someone in the audience is a little bit more automotively inclined and can tell me exactly why they've done this, but I thought it was still at least interesting enough to note. 
At the back, there's a couple of interesting features to note. Firstly, you're going to see the beams, which seem to be the main support structure or frame of the vehicle. You think ordinarily the frame of a truck or whatever will be underneath and everything gets bolted on top. Not really the case here. If you get down underneath and look up, you're going to see the, the engine open to all. There's no obvious supporting beams. There are a couple of cross beams that bolt into the, the side beams, and they will also, you'll see the beams at the front as well. So, yeah, no monocoques here. This is, yeah, very, very brutish. Other thing, you'll see the brakes for the wheels. So these are air brakes. So as the vehicle is driving along, every 10 or 15 seconds, you're going to hear the pressure release of the air hissing out. And that's actually a good sign, because if you're driving along for more than 30 seconds or a minute, you don't hear the psh of the uh, air brakes, you know you have no brakes. So you have a little bit of advanced warning to start figuring out where you're going to crash. Again, big leaf springs. Uh, the engine underneath is the AEC 195. Now, the earlier uh, AEC armored cars to Mark 1s came out with the 190. This is 195. It's 158 horsepower. It is a diesel. It is also a, uh, a motor found in buses, if I recall correctly. Radiator at the back. Engine obviously under the two hatches. That we're, we're not going to turn the turret to open the hatches, but that's how you would do it. A uh, couple of lights, and, you know, I don't see a towing pendle. This armored car can't tow anything. Right, that's it. The left side of the vehicle is just as ugly as the right side of the vehicle. I, I'm sure that some mother would love this. That's not for me. I do note the little lifting eye up there should you wish to pull the turret. But other than that, and the fire extinguisher on the fender there, I think we'll call it quits on the outside. So in that case, I will come back to you in a week or two, and we'll take a tour of the inside. I'll talk to you then. This is not an ugly armored car. <laughs> so you're the mother that likes it, okay. I, I should say he was the lead restorer for this vehicle. He might be biased.